Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLinks, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Food Security, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on Catalyzing Action and Agricultural Transformation in Africa, Taking the Pulse of CADAP. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And I'll be your webinar facilitator today, so you'll hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer sessions. USAID and BFS are really excited to be hosting this webinar in collaboration with African Union Partners and Feed the Future's Africa LEAD program. We're excited to help engage a broad audience in taking the pulse on the current status of the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, also known as CADAP, which has been operating for almost 15 years now, and also to share some information about new tools and efforts that seek to leverage this robust African-owned initiative to help catalyze data-driven action towards accelerating improved food security and resilience on the continent. We're also excited to be hosting this webinar on the heels of the 15th CADAP Partnership Platform Meeting, which was held in Nairobi last week, and which is an annual continental forum for promoting learning, reflection, and adaptive management among CADAP stakeholders. We have some great experts on the panel to reflect on just how far we've come, what we've learned, and some of the exciting new developments that are taking CADAP into a new phase of implementation. Feed the Future's Africa LEAD program will be facilitating this session as part of their overarching mandate to support African Union institutions, member states, and local stakeholders through facilitation, communication, and learning within the CADAP context. Very quickly, before we dive into the content, um, I just want to orient you to a couple of pieces. First, um, and most of you have already done so, please do use the chat box to introduce yourselves, to ask questions, and to share resources. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar and we'll ask as many as we can after the presentations. You'll see that the slides are available for download on the bottom left of your screen, as well as a couple of recommended resources. And lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the recording, the transcript, and some additional resources once they're ready and they will also be posted on AgriLinks. All right, I am going to introduce our first speaker, uh, and then we can get started. So I'd like to introduce Shannon Sarbo, who is the Deputy Chief of Party for Africa LEAD, and she supports Africa LEAD's continental activities and the activities uh, monitoring, evaluation, and learning uh, elements. And she will be giving a brief introduction to our topic and to our next speaker. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone who's calling in. We're so pleased to have everybody on the call today. Um, like Julie mentioned, my name is Shannon Sarbo, and I work on the Africa LEAD Project, which is a USAID-funded Africa-wide project that's focused on strengthening leadership, building institutional capacity, and facilitating learning for CADAP implementation at all levels. Today is the first webinar in our final program learning series. And at the end of today's webinar, we'll be sharing some more information about how you can get involved in some of the future events. So to dive right in, um, CADEP stands for the Continental Africa Agricultural Development Program. And if you're not familiar with it, we're really hoping this webinar will be a useful orientation. CADEP is a program of the African Union that's been in place for almost 15 years. And like Julie mentioned, a lot of momentum has been generated and progress has been made. But today, this continental program still remains largely misunderstood by a variety of agricultural stakeholders. So what we're hoping to do here today is, one, follow up on the CADAP Partnership Platform meeting, like Julie mentioned, it was just held last week here in Nairobi but also really take this opportunity to up update a broad set of agricultural stakeholders on the current status of CADEP. We're really lucky to have some great experts on the line with us here. Ernest Rosendaza with the African Union, Fatmara Sewo from the Economic Community of West African States, we call that ECOWAS, and Augustine Wamboyamju from the African Union Development Agency who are going to help us reflect on just how far we've come and what we've learned and kind of tee up some exciting new developments that are going to take CADEP into a next phase of implementation. So Africa LEAD is facilitating this session as part of our overarching mandate um, 
to support the African Union and African stakeholders through facilitation, strategic communication, and learning within the CADAP context. So that's why we are going to be your facilitators today. Um, next, I'd like to just do a brief run-through of the agenda for today's conversation. I'll introduce my colleague Robert Uma in a second, who's going to give us a sort of introduction and an overview of CADEP. Then we'll open it up to a panel discussion. We have some pre-programmed questions that we'll tee up for them. Um, and then we'll open it up to you to hear some questions from the audience that Julie and Robert are going to help moderate. And then we'll close and wrap up and have some ideas about how you can get involved in, in future events. So that's it for now. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Robert Uma. Robert is a senior CADEP policy advisor on Africa LEAD, and he's been working very closely with the African Union on many of the topics we're going to discuss today. So over to you, Robert. Well, thank you very much, Shannon, for that introduction, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm really glad to be here and to speak to all of you about what is a, a critically important subject in African development, CADAP, that uh, the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program. Um, CADAP is Africa's policy framework for agricultural development uh, and agriculture-led development in, in, in particular. And CADAP's objectives broadly include um, the big aims of reducing poverty, increasing the level of food security, uh, providing jobs and incomes, and, and, and what you would say are the, the usual big picture developmental goals, but using agriculture to achieve that. Um, I'm going to take you through the development of CADAP over the, the years and how it started. And uh, right now on your screen, you should be seeing a timeline. CADAP uh, started about 2003 with uh, what was known as the Maputo Declaration, uh, which was made by African heads of state uh, sitting in Maputo. Uh, and they were concerned with some of the big issues uh, in Africa, like the idea that a lot of Africans were still malnourished, and it's still the case now that Africa has uh, about over 20% of the population is malnourished, and the fact that Africa spends a lot of money uh, on food imports. I think current statistics are anywhere between 35 to $40 billion a year, and there was a feeling that using agriculture, uh, developing agriculture, would be a way to develop broadly the economies of African countries. Uh, and during the decade between 2003 and 2014, the focus of CADAP was really to try and encourage faster agricultural growth. Um, in fact, there was a target of 6% growth during that, that period, the first 10 years of CADAP. And there was a big uh, focus also on trying to encourage African countries to spend more money from their budget expenditure. Uh, in fact, the target was 10%, putting 10% of agriculture expenditure, of, of national expenditure into agriculture so as to spur agriculture-led growth. And so for those 10 years, the Maputo Declaration was the focal point and created a lot of focus on agriculture and there was planning and plenty of activities within the continent around uh, policy making for agricultural development, uh, tools and processes and analysis uh, to encourage countries to do more on agriculture. Um, and this uh, went on until 2014 when there was a, a, what you could call a pause and reflect and 2014 was actually the year of agriculture, and many countries came together and uh, convened by the African Union to reflect on how the first 10 years of CADAP had gone, and some of the lessons of those first 10 years informed a second declaration, which is known as the Malabo Declaration, um, which brought a more results 
focused into CADAP and expanded CADAP significantly to account for what was seen as the multifaceted, multidisciplinary nature of agricultural development. And uh, the Malabo Declaration, and I'll, I'll show you what some of the elements are in a moment, uh, helped to rejuvenate, refocus CADAP around some seven clear goals, which are currently the, the main target um, to achieve those goals by 2025. Um, but one important element of the Malabo Declaration is what was called a biennial review, which, which simply means uh, a mechanism to measure progress every two years, progress as far as the targets, the objectives of the Malabo declarations are concerned. And uh, so that's been going on, and uh, we are going to talk about that shortly. Uh, so that timeline tells you the, the, the evolution of, of CADAP over the years. Um, CADAP itself, and particularly with the current Malabo declaration that kind of underpins its, its uh, implementation, is very closely related to the um, sustainable development goals, particularly uh, SDG number two. Um, there's a very close relationship, but it's also very closely related. In fact, it implements an African uh, aspirational uh, vision known as the Agenda 2063, um, which uh, the first aspiration there is really about the, the about food security, and in particular, trying to ensure that there is a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development, of which one of the most important elements is a healthy and well-nourished uh, citizenry and modern agriculture, uh, increased productivity and production, and envir environmental sustainability. All of these elements in, in Agenda 2063 are actually covered in the uh, Malabo Declaration. I did uh, mention that the Malabo Declaration has got seven broad targets. We call them the Malabo Commitments. And if you do look, uh, I, I think we are going to post on your, on your screen uh, a copy of the Malabo Declaration for those who are interested. Uh, right on your screen, you have got those seven commitments, uh, a recommitment to the values and principles of the CADA process, enhancing increased investment finance into agriculture, which is a deepening of what were the original objectives of CADA, ending hunger by 2025, cutting poverty by half, uh, by 2025, particularly through inclusive agricultural growth and transformation, boosting intra-Africa trade in agricultural commodities and services. Some of you might be aware that we now have in place the continental free trade area in Africa, which uh, supplements this objective of uh, objective five of the Malabo Declaration. The sixth one is on enhancing resilience of livelihoods and production systems, particularly to climate variability and other shocks. And the final one is strengthening mutual accountability to actions and results. And this links very well to the point I made earlier about a biennial review, a means and a mechanism for measuring performance. Um, in my next slide, uh, I presented something on the biennial review uh, process which I think is uh, an innovative and data-driven uh, approach to showing how well countries are implementing uh, the Malabo Declaration. Uh, the previous, the last biennial review was really covering 2017, and it was evaluating country performance. It had uh, uh, indicators across the seven thematic areas and 23 performance categories. 43 indicators in total, and some of the things we could say about it is that it overall enhances Africa's capacity for knowledge and data generation and management. Um, in a way, it is strengthening the appreciation uh, for data-driven uh, decision-making and for reflection around performance. So this is a, a new and interesting thing in, 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 in agricultural development in Africa. Uh, it's also helping to institutionalize a system of peer review. 
where countries look at each other's performance and explain to each other why and why, and why they are not performing as well as they should towards the targets that they committed themselves to in 2014. Um, and this is happening frequently enough on a biennial basis. Uh, and, and the reports are delivered at a very high level to heads of state um, when they meet in Addis Ababa every two years to reflect on, on ongoing performance. Uh, the, the results of the first biennial review that I just re, re, talked about uh, were out um, for 2017. 47 member states reported. Eight of them were unable to report for various reasons, uh, including issues like conflict, uh, capacity issues, and other things. Um, the performance overall is presented as a summary in terms of a scorecard, where each country has a score that's a, a kind of a, 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 a total compilation of all the indicators that shows how far they are from achieving the Malabo commitment. Um, and I, perhaps I should say at this point that the biennial review was actually measuring performance covering the year, the period 2015 to 2016, uh, and the next one will cover 2017 right up to 2018, so it's going to be up to 2019, and it's going to be released in 2020, January 2020. Um, the last biennial review showed that 20 countries were on track. Being on track meant that they have uh, achieved a minimum overall score uh, of 3.95 out of 10. 10 is the, is the total score to be able to say that you on track to achieving the 2025 goals. Uh, so by within the first two years, you should have achieved 3.94 if you're going to make it to 10 by 2025. And so 20 countries were on track, but 27 countries were not on track. Uh, the average score was 3.6, which is below the, the, the required score. Um, and so that was the result, and you can see on that map the countries that were on track and those that weren't and those that had no data. Um, so overall, this is how CADAP is being implemented. Um, it is a unique and uh, interesting uh, development in, uh, in Africa. And we think, a lot of us, that this is something that's going to be potentially uh, transformative. But CADAP has not been without some challenges. And in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, perhaps more, we are going to have a conversation with the three panelists that were introduced earlier. That's uh, Ernest Ruzindaza from the African Union Commission, the Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture, uh, Fatmata Seiwo, who's from ECOWAS. Um, and uh, ECOWAS is the regional economic bloc for West Africa. Um, and lastly, uh, Agustin Wamboyamju, who's from the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD. NEPAD is the new partnership for Africa's development. Um, I'll say a little bit more about uh, Ernest, uh, Fatmata, and Agustin. Ernest Ruzindaza spent a lot of time working in the public sector in Rwanda. He was a permanent secretary. He has more than 15 years' experience in managing the agricultural sector uh, in, in a, at a country level. Um, uh, uh, seven of those years was PS, actually. And he currently lead, leads the CADA program at the African Union, um, and he, he therefore has a very unique angle to all of this having worked at country level and having worked at continental level, so we are really happy to have Ernest with us. But Mata, on the other hand, is from uh, ECOWAS, as I said. Uh, she joined ECOWAS in 2014 and is currently the uh, CADAP M&D program officer. Not just CADAP, but actually ECOWAP. ECOWAP is the ECOWAS uh, regional agriculture program. Um, she has plenty of experience as well, particularly in M&E, working under the, the Directorate 
of uh, Agriculture and Rural Development in, in the ECOWAS Commission. She's based in Abuja, Nigeria, um, and she has been working at all these levels, at continental level, supporting the biennial review um, and other things, as well as at regional level with a multiplicity of states, both Anglophone and Francophone, and then, of course, at, can at country level. Uh, so we are really happy to have uh, Fatmata with us. Last but not least is Agustin Wambo Yamju, uh, who has, uh, I think, almost 19 years' experience uh, in this sector, but more broadly also in program design in, and implementation, knowledge management, M&E, and coaching. Uh, he started off working as a private consultant and has had stints with FAO, Resax, and the Global Donor Platform, all of which were linked to CADAP in some ways, uh, finally joining um, the AU Development Agency, NEPAD, where he's worked um, for some years now, and he's currently the head of NEPAD, of CADAP at NEPAD. So I want to welcome this three distinguished guests. Um, our conversation will cover three broad topics. The first is country ownership of CADAP and CADAP processes. Um, many people say that CADAP, one of CADAP's biggest challenges has been its failure to secure greater understanding and country ownership uh, and, and as a result, maybe we have not achieved as much increased investment uh, into agriculture by governments and also by development partners. Um, to start us off, Augustine, um, what are the steps, uh, just going to this country ownership issue, what are the steps that a country needs to take in order to be considered CADAP compliant? Um, what are the key elements? Uh, of a CADA process that then once a country has gone through, uh, just in the interest of many of our listeners who may not be familiar with the CADA country processes, uh, so that you could say if you go through these steps or these elements are in place, then you you have full ownership of CADA. Augustine, if you can hear me. Thank you, Robert, for the introduction. Uh, I think we are having a very interesting conversation on a topic that is very dear to our, to our hearts. Just quickly to the point that you raised, Robert, uh, the, there are some key steps that country has to cover for uh, whatever they have in the context of CADA to be Malabo compliant. Actually, uh, following the adoption of the declaration in Malabo, country has to embark on what we call the domestication of the Malabo Declaration. The domestication of Malabo Declaration has basically three main deliverables. The country has to uh, take stock of where it stands vis-a-vis CADET. The country has to come up with the Malabo Declaration country roadmap. And the country has to demonstrate that uh, he has popularized the declaration for uh, broadening the outreach, for raising awareness, reaching a broader range of stakeholders. So those key elements constitute what we call the domestication of the Marble Declaration. From there now, the country has to come up with uh, a report on the current status of affairs. We can call it a stock-taking report. We can call it uh, anything else, depending on countries. But at a minimum, we should be in a position to have a clear picture of where the country stands. Uh, we also encourage the country to have some clarity on how does it plan to work with the agribusiness and private sector to mobilize investment. This means we could introduce the conversation here around the country agribusiness partnership framework. The country has to formulate a NAIP, a national agricultural investment plan, or to appraise the existing one, 
after formulating the naive, it has the document has to go through independent technical review by people who are not involved in the formulation in the first place. And this will have to lead to stakeholder dialogue and joint implementation agenda at a country level in an inclusive way. Meaning that all key constituencies of cutting in the country have to be involved in a broader consult in the broad consultation. Uh, what comes out of this uh, process is the final national agricultural resident plan, which is naive. It has to be implemented. So, moving from that step, which was the national agricultural plan, formation or appraisal, the second step, we go into the third one, which is the implementation, the actual implementation. How do you operationalize the content of the naive to make sure that you generate the type of impact that you want to see on the ground? both in terms of volume and quality. You have to have your staging plan. You have to uh, have a plan on how to work with the private sector. You have to establish your mutual accountability system. You have to uh, uh, have a manual planning that is informed by implementation. So this is what we call implementation, which is an important step, the third one. Now, uh, to see the Malabo compliance, you have to really work the talk. Your mutual accountability on that Malabo declaration it has to be in place. The mechanism for you to be able to collect information, analyze, and inform the kind of progress you are making has to be there. Information has to be collected in a timely manner using the tools and instruments that we have generated in the context of the DNA review process. So if a country is aligning its operations in full on all these four major steps or major components, uh, the country is classified as having aligned its operations to Malabo declaration. So the life of the country that is being implemented is uh, Malabo compliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Augustine, uh, for taking us through those steps. Uh, uh, I mean, I was just listening to you, and and it sounds really smooth and and uh, very easy to do. Um, but I wonder, and turning to you, Alex, particularly having worked at country level, you have been a permanent secretary in the thick of things in in in, in Rwanda, working off from Kigali, and then later on at the African Union. We still hear people, and I think that they, they do have a point, saying that there's not so much ownership at country level. It seems that country ownership of CADA processes and, and, and some of these steps appears to be a challenge. Um, why? Why is it such a challenge? And in your opinion, what, what have we learned about over the years, particularly at about how to improve engagement uh, in CADAP at country level? Because the plan looks really good, the process seems clear, but we still have challenges with ownership at country level. What's your, what's your view, what's your take on this, Anne? All right, as we, as we try to figure out Anne's connection, maybe I will ask Fatmata a question. And, and, and part of the challenge, Fatmata, is also the role of Rex, which appears to be understated in some cases in CADAP, and some have commented that uh, RECs, and uh, for, for our uninitiated listeners, RECs are regional economic communities, so ECOWAS is just one of them that covers the West Africa part. We've got the East African community in East Africa and Southern Africa development community in South Africa and uh, what is known as the Arab Maghreb Union, uh, or UMA for short, in the north, and there's another one in Central Africa. So Fatmata happens to sit in the one that covers what I think is probably the largest, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and Fatmata, what, what value do RECs add, or can RECs add to the CADA process in countries, regions, and at the continental level? During the first phase of the CADA process, clearly RECs were simply being mentioned as a... Um, part of the CADAP team to implement at the regional and country levels. But in terms of real action, that was not very, very intensive. 
But by the time we got through to the first 10 years of the CADEP process, the role of the REC have evolved because if you look at the implementation modalities for the CADEP 2015-2025, you will see that um, there is more emphasis laid on optimizing the existing blocks, the regional economic communities. And it's mainly because of two reasons, because it has been clearly recognized that for our cultural development to really take its right course, especially at the national level, it cannot be done without the regional economic communities because the effects seem to have more um, opportunities to coordinate their country in harmonizing policies, standards, and regulations. And as well, during the process from the first phase to the second phase, we had a lot of improvement in our capacity. So, for example, at the ECOWAS level, we had a CADEP advisor. We were able to develop an ECOWAS agricultural policy, and a lot of lessons have been drawn. So you will see that there has been that trend from just being un understated to really taking our role as regional economic communities. So the value that REX can add to the CADEP process, clearly, REX primarily are key to increasing the recognition of the importance and potential added value of regional actions on agriculture. So if you want to see the regional and the countries performing well, it's very important to have the REX managing their respective countries. And during Augustine's presentation, he spoke about domestication. So if you want to see sustained domestication of the CADEP process, clearly the REX have to take the lead role. We have to facilitate the implementation of um, also, you know that when the CADEP is developed and is translated into our regional agricultural policy, we have our investment plans that have been developed. So we have a regional agricultural investment plan, and the countries have their national agricultural investment plan. So the, the RECs easily facilitate implementation of their regional agricultural investment plan. So for ECOWAS, as an example, to help us do that easily, we established a regional agency for agriculture and food, and it has helped to address capacity issues so that they really focus on the, um, supervising, monitoring, and tracking how projects and programs are implemented towards regional agricultural investment plan. REGs are also able to establish multi-stakeholder task forces on specific things. At the ECOWAS level, we talk about the food reserve, for example, or value chain. So if you have the REGs managing that, it's able to easily align country by country as well as in harmonizing, like I said earlier, the process, the policy, and the formulation. So that as a region, ECOWAS, for example, having 15 countries is very easy to coordinate and make sure that we're able to drive all the countries to, towards achieving the CADEP um, policy or the CADEP Thanks, Thanks very much for an elaborate and very clear answer. Um, I wonder if Ernest is back with us yet. Uh, but as we try to figure out how to get him on, I, I want to come back to you, Augustine, with a question that I posed to Ernest, and maybe like in a minute, if in your experience you have some hypothesis or some explanation why countries still find it hard to get engaged in the CADA process, and potentially a suggestion on how that, that could be improved. Thank you very much, Robert, and thank you, uh, everyone, attending this uh, conversation. It's really, really good to have this uh, conversation today. After this uh, CADA PP, this successful CADA PP, I think reflecting on uh, on where we are in implementing CADA is very important so that we draw lessons and uh, we also chart a way forward. Um, as you know, Robert and uh, uh, colleagues here, uh, we, uh, we have done a comprehensive review after 10 years of uh, CADAP implementation, uh, before we come up with this chart that you are, you are, you are showing here, that draw uh, CADAP implementation guidelines. So the purpose was to see how is CADAP implemented at country level. 
And how CADAP as a framework is actually driving uh, agricultural transformation agenda at country level. So uh, I would say that uh, what we've seen in many countries, uh, the picture is not really harmonized. Uh, we have visited, uh, I would say, six to eight countries. Uh, we have seen countries where uh, CADAP has been embedded into the country planning system. A country where CADAP is part of the country planning cycle. And we have seen other countries where, where CADAP is just another project. Uh, countries have uh, developed their naives just to praise a request that came that was coming from African Union, and they will have like three frameworks that are guiding the country planning process. So this, these are two different pictures, and of course we also have countries where we don't have uh, even guiding gu guiding strategies. Uh, those are countries mostly which have not able to sign. The, the compact. So what we've seen uh, for the first category is the countries that have actually embedded the CADAP principles that have been able to uh, align CADAP, align, uh, uh, you know, take CADAP, own it, and embed it to the country planning process, and therefore uh, translate that plan into the budget planning. Augustine has uh, uh, actually mentioned the, the, the spending plan. Of course, the spending plan should be uh, the one informing the budget uh, 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 planning process at country level. So today, in, in what we are trying to do with countries, uh, we are, of course, checking if the naive which are available in countries are the ones informing uh, the country budget planning process. So what we've, we are seeing in countries is that countries are really different. You have an AIP which is not even informing the country pl uh, budget planning process, and you have a misalignment even at country level with partners who are, who are supporting uh, those AIPs. Partners have put money into these processes, but when it comes to implementation, because the implementation is guided by the country plan and the budget plan and when the diet is not informing that budget plan then alignment and harmonization to that plan becomes a, a very big challenge and of course it goes with also uh, coordination because you can only coordinate a plan which is owned by everyone you can govern a plan which is owned by everyone and uh, what we are trying to uh, uh, Third countries is of course to make sure that uh, the CADAP is important, but alignment to the country planning cycle is also very important if you want countries to implement confidently, uh, you know, in alignment with the, their aspiration, of course, uh, what is, is captured in the NAIP. So this, this is the key lesson, and I think to the countries where they are aligning. Uh, budget to the, uh, where NAIP is informing NAIP, we are also seeing uh, implementation happening very uh, efficiently. Thank you. Thank you, Anes, and I'm, I'm glad that you made this point. It seems like aligning CADAP uh, with, with the country's own um, national processes for planning and budgeting is, is a key lesson for all of us. Uh, particularly those listening from African countries who are wondering how to to make CADAP uh, stronger in the country. Uh, thanks so much for all the points you made. I'd like to turn uh, our attention, um, and uh, sooner or later I'm going to open it up to our listeners to also ask some questions, but for the moment I'd like to turn our attention to the issue of NAIP, the National Agriculture Investment Plan, and particularly what we consider their utility in the, in the, in the CADAP process. And uh, I have less time, so I'm probably going to ask you to try and uh, see if you could respond in a minute or so. I'll stay with you, Ernest, for now. Why, why is NAIP, the National Agriculture Investment Plan, considered the tool of choice uh, by the African Union for, you know, uh, ensuring that uh, 
these continental declarations are implemented in countries? And, and how does the AU do that? How does it use NAIPS to influence the implementation of its CADAP agenda? In a way, you probably began to touch on this, but what, what, what's your take on this? Uh, thank you, Robert. I, I think uh, NAIP, I mean, we are calling it NAIP, but when it is embedded at country level, it can have different names. Uh, for example, come to Rwanda, you will not see anything called NAIP. Because in the strategic plan for agricultural transformation, they will say that this is our NAIP. So different countries have different names, but NAIP is uh, a domesticated investment plan at country level. It's, let's say it's a, it's a, Kada, it's a Malabo, uh, you know, at country level. It's a Malabo uh, declaration, uh, domesticated at country level. And uh, what we are trying to say is that this naive of today is different from the, for, for, for the naive that we used to have because the naive touches seven key important commitments which are not necessarily uh, part of the agricultural ministry. It calls for, for greater coordination because it's discussing not only uh, issues related to agriculture, to agriculture, let's say increased productivity, but also touches on issues that are managed outside of the agricultural ministry, which means that it is important to come up with you know, greater coordination. So it's a, it's a third tool because if you don't have a plan, you will not know a plan which trans translates your targets by 2025 because our declaration uh, has a, a clear target by 2025. If you don't have a plan, you will not be able to also coordinate your interventions at country level. So um, in respect of CADA principles, Making sure that, uh, you know, uh, countries, country stakeholders led by government, uh, private, uh, you know, with the involvement of private sector, kind of non-state actors come together and agree on a plan that leads to, uh, achieving the Malabo target, which is called, let's say, naive by African Union jargon, but domesticated and can come, can have a, a, a country name, you know, come with you know, ambitious interventions with clear, uh, you know, policies and investment that leads to, to those targets is very, very important. And, uh, and also uh, making sure that this plan, uh, you know, is very clear on what capacity is needed to get it implemented. One is to, to have uh, um, ambitions, but also it's important to be clear on how you also strengthen the capacity for operation. So I think there is an element that we, 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 we need to, to get into consideration in this discussion. We somehow uh, lose the focus of the content of the naive and stick to, the, to just to the process to get a naive. But when you get a naive, the important thing is to get this naive implemented. A naive implementation, uh, of course, will be linked to how we evaluate this naive. But this is really the central element. How do we support member states? I mean, now all players, development partners, technical partners, private sector, kind of non-state actors, and farmers themselves come together to implement these naive, which have been uh, formulated in a very participatory manner, and translate uh, the ambitions of heads of state. How do we make sure that this is implemented? Of course, you have taken, you, you mentioned, um, you know, investment. Investment is very key. But investment will, will come only if we are translated, if we are clear that what we are going to implement uh, evidently can lead to the targets or to uh, aspirations that are captured in the NAIP. That's why uh, one of the call for Malabo is really to abide to evidence-based planning and, of course, uh, performance-based and peer review uh, embedded in, uh, in, uh, in, in this biannual review that also we'll, we'll discuss. All Thank right. you. Thanks, thanks Ernest. 
Uh, in a moment, I'm going to go to the metrics of all this, including the biennial review and how different actors are involved. Uh, but just to close off on the naive, I, uh, someone was telling me at the CADA PP the other day that only a handful of countries have actually reviewed or reformulated their national agricultural investment plans to reflect the, the Malabo Declaration. And this is five years after the, the declaration itself and five years before we have to see the, the results. Um, and I'm wondering, Augustine, what suggestions do you have for speeding up the reformulation? Uh, first of all, if you do have the statistics, that would be quite helpful, like how many countries have got Malabo-compliant naive, and, and then what's your one or two suggestions for speeding up that process of getting naive to reflect uh, the Malabo declaration? Yes, Robert, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Can hear you loud and clear. Yes, I think uh, the domestication process, from the experience of the past three years, has been a very uh, uh, how would I call it, uh, kind of slow one. Uh, countries embark on uh, domesticating the Malabo Declaration in their night. But uh, as you would imagine, implementation of something continues to happen. By the time you are done with everything, including the VR, uh, we're talking about two, three years. Uh, uh, what I can say about this is that, uh, yes, it's something that is good to start. It's also good not to, uh, for it to drag for too long. Ideally, if you have uh, to spend like, uh, eight months to 12 months to complete the package to make sure that you are fully aligned to Malabo Declaration, is uh, that's very okay. Otherwise, when it drags for far too long, uh, some fatigue uh, starts to kick in. Now, going back to the statistics, you were asking me how many countries can we confidently say are fully Malabo compliant. Uh, Fatmata will correct me here if I'm wrong, maybe except two countries in ECOWAS that are not yet fully uh, uh, aligned with their plan. I think out of the 15, 13 are fully Malabo compliant. And when we move to the other region, Southern Africa and Eastern Africa, uh, the commercial countries and the southern countries, including the East African community countries, we are talking of uh, around seven countries or so. And now you move uh, central, uh, the country, there is a group of countries at the moment that are working towards domesticating Malabo declaration into our national investment plan. Uh, we are working currently uh, with eight countries in total from uh, within central, eastern, and southern Africa that are also uh, trying to align their operations to the content of Malabo declaration. Now, one question you were asking me, one point that you want to raise is uh, what is making it so difficult for countries to uh, move and fully embrace the Malabo Declaration? I think uh, it is one thing to commit to do A, B, C, D. Actually doing it is something different. Uh, from experience, countries embrace the Maputo Declaration, uh, came up with the National Investment Plan, they were under the impression that uh, resources would flow from somewhere to come and fund the plan that they had put together. That did not materialize because uh, it was important for their own resources, in-country resources to be mobilized to be able to fund the actual implementation. Uh, looking at uh, how countries are behaving today, uh, uh, history seems to be repeating itself. We are also facing challenges with some countries that are really uh, uh, struggling to put the resources that are required for national stakeholder consultations to, to take place. Again, they are turning to the African institutions to uh, mobilize resources to even bring uh, stakeholders together to agree on the key priorities that have to go into national investment plan. 
So the ownership, as Ernest mentioned, is very key. It has to start from the beginning. Country has to demonstrate that uh, they are very much in charge. They want to take the lead and show the way. Uh, additional support could come from government partners or from African institutions, but the country resources have to be what helps to fuel the process towards uh, having a knife that is Mahabo compliant. This is only the formation. There is also another challenge that we are seeing. The Biennial Review, I'm sure we're going to talk about it in a minute, but uh, the Biennial Review has created something that we didn't witness before. Countries are struggling to ensure that they have a report that is selling, meaning that they have to improve their score. In doing that, their main focus for some of them is mostly on receiving support to be able to collect the data, inform all the indicators, analyze them, and prepare the report. Completely overlooking the need for them to come up with a knife that is marble compliant, that is taking into account all the key elements that are captured into the marble declaration. So if a country's focus is more on the general review, or scoring high, what about making sure that you have in place a mechanism that is going to create the results that you need to come on track? So this is another challenge that we are facing. So countries are still, for some, waiting to be assisted from outside. But uh, luckily, there are some very uh, uh, there, are, there are some countries that are very uh, proactive that are taking advantage of the lessons that have been learned so far to uh, show the, the direction to say that yes, we take full responsibility for what happens on our ground. We have to be the ones uh, setting the tone. And we want to walk the talk. So we are happy thank to you. These, these yeah. are many. Yeah, thank you so much, Agustin, for those comments. I, I'll probably cut down our conversation so that we can save some time to have some feedback and uh, at least answer some questions from those who are listening to us. But I do want to ask one last question around the, the biennial review and particularly mutual accountability. And I think it's also one of the topics that many of those who are listening are sending in messages about and asking questions. But I want to start by just asking each of you to help us unpack this idea of mutual accountability. Uh, in general, it seems like we are trying to achieve collective impact, and so we are using some kind of shared metric system, and we are being accountable to each other. And But many people do not understand exactly what, what we mean when we say mutual accountability in CADAP. Uh, and I want to start with you, Fatmata, like, in just a minute, this is, uh, this, this is uh, actually commitment number seven. The heads of state sat down. They made commitments covering very specific uh, content areas, I could call them, like resilience or hunger and so on. But their seventh commitment sound, sounded a little different, like, Strengthen our accountability to each other, mutual accountability to, as to actions and results through a results framework. And a lot of people are looking at Africa and saying that's interesting. Um, so, Fatmata, what, what does mutual accountability mean to you? Can you help us unpack this idea from your standpoint uh, at, at ECOWAS? And if you could do so like in a minute or so. Accountability is the same at the continental level. It's about you and I agreeing that I will do this, you will do that, and time after time we sit back to reflect to see what we agreed to do, we have done. So I took a decision, I will provide this, you agreed to provide that, and we agree within a timeline and quickly check to see what progress we have made towards our commitment. That's the simplest definition. I can give you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Fatmata. Um, uh, Augustine, do you have a different take on this? 
what what does it mean from from where you sit or is, do you have any additional point on on mutual accountability within the context of CADA? if you could say something in a minute yes can you can you hear me uh yes uh, my take my take on the matter is very simple uh going back to uh what uh, CADA stood for CADA wanted to bring a new way of doing business in agriculture this was back in 2003. Uh, this was in the context of a new partnership for africa's development and there was a, a an agreement that uh, the time had come for africa to take lead but africa was also of the view that uh, we still, con we still need needed to continue to work with uh, the, the development partners in a mutually uh, uh, respectable manner where people are held accountable to what the committee do and the results that they achieve. Translated in the, in the agricultural sector, that was what it was supposed to be. But for the first, most probably, uh, three years of CADEP, we were going through the issue of uh, accountability in the context of the Paris Declaration. But after some point, that concept kind of uh, started to be diluted. Now, with the BR, the notion of uh, holding partners mutually accountable has come back to the fore. But how much mutual is this accountability? This is a question that we may at some point would like to address. For the time being, we see African countries agreeing to report, to track progress and report on what the committee do, their performance. Uh, it is now with the new BR, uh, the new cycle that we're looking at how to uh, establish a easily uh, uh, measurable indicator for the other parts, for the development partners. How much are they putting in? What do they commit to, to do? And how much are they working the talk? So this is, in my understanding, notion of much like I'm committing the context of CADEP. Thanks, thanks, Augustine, for that. And I'll, I'll finish this, just the understanding mutual accountability with you, Ernest, again in a minute. Um, what, do you have a different angle to, to it? Mutual accountability? Uh, thank you, Robert. Um, I think the mutual accountability that is uh, mentioned here has actually stipulated in the call of action from uh, mutual accountability to action and result. Right. Um, but we, we, did, we did get at least your first, your first point about it being, uh, being accountable for uh, action and results. So it's not just accountability for results, but also for actions that lead to those results. And, uh, and I think we, 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 are, we are running short of time, but I'm hoping that we could uh, somehow go over for a few minutes, uh, just because we started a bit late, and then that will allow us to address some of the questions that have come in. Um, and I want to keep to this topic and ask about data quality. So. The, the whole topic of mutual accountability uh, within CADAP is also driven by the biennial review. And we have questions uh, coming in from some of our listeners asking about the quality of the data. Some of them suggest that uh, the experience has been that the, in some cases there is poor quality data uh, or lack of data, and, uh, and this has affected the uh, you know, the reliability and the confidence with which we look at these results in the DR. And I, I just want to come back to you, Ernest, and find out whether you have a response to this, this challenge of quality of data. Yes. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, we knew from the beginning that uh, the data quality is very, very a big problem. We knew from the beginning because, uh, because of the self-reporting but the purpose, one of the purpose of uh, this biannual review is also to strengthen country systems. So while we are reporting, we also need to make sure that countries have strong data systems that can inform different indicators 
that are, can't, uh, that, that are captured uh, you know, in this uh, uh, journey review. Um, the question will now be, how do we accompany countries to strengthen their data system so that when they report, they report confidently with, with quality data, number one. Number two, how do we make sure that countries, when they report, they report validated reports by all country stakeholders so that at least we are sure that uh, countries have made their efforts to uh, uh, mobilize uh, you know, existing data at country level or from different sources. So number three, we wanted also to increase ownership of the reports. Because uh, I remember from uh, the first report, during the presentation of the first report in the summit, heads of state themselves were asking, where did you come with this data? And the only response that was bringing some peace, you know, during the presentation is that the data came from the country. This, this is the process that we use to collect data from, you know, from the country, from ministry collected at rate level and come up, come to African Union. I think one of the call uh, of uh, the report was to strengthen country data system, and we, uh, as a CADAP fraternity, to make sure that, you know, we also respond to this call, uh, technical partners, uh, development partners, African Union and countries themselves together with REC. Support country system, support countries to come up with their own data. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest, for that. And I think the broader data issues, I think, within uh, CADAP. Um, Augustine, earlier on we were having a conversation about compliance with, with NAIP and the process and so on, and I liked a lot of your answers. Um, some of our listeners have also commented on that. And, and one question that's come up that I think would be useful to clarify is whether they, there is any evidence, maybe from a study or even anecdotal, to show that when you are Malabo compliant, when you follow some of those CADA processes to the letter, does it reflect in your performance? Is there a, a, a way to show that by, by having a compliant naive or signing the compact and doing all these other things, it then directly leads to, to better performance? Um, could you care to comment on that? Yes, thank you very much for the question. I think uh, it's a very good one. It keeps coming. For the past four years, I think we've been receiving this. Uh, I just wanted to uh, suggest that uh, RUFAC, if free, uh, released a study uh, last year, I believe, uh, showing kind of the journey from uh, uh, Maputo to Malabo uh, and to where we are today and showing how many countries are really uh, uh, seen as those who have fully embraced CADEP and comparing their performance to the performance of those which have not embraced CADEP or not so fully and uh, it was a, a, a correlation between the current performance today and the tardiness for a country to embrace CADEP or the, uh, the, the kind of um, uh, not so rigorous way of uh, embracing the values and principles, including the fact that uh, CADEP has to be uh, 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 inclusive, the process has to be inclusive, what goes into the night has to be a reflection of a national consensus. Countries where we've seen good results or better results are countries that are one, early adopters of values and principles of CADEP. They may not have called what they were doing CADEP, but uh, they were doing exactly what CADEP was, was recommending. Two, countries with uh, a very strong visionary leadership, showing the direction, trying to stick to what the committee do. A country with a knife that, that is fully aligned to the National Development Plan. The NIPE is not stated in the ministry as just another project in an office with uh, the next office running a project parallel to that one. 
at times competing. Countries with a very uh, strong in-country coordination mechanism among the development partners and the government. The in-country coordination mechanism open to other stakeholders, including including the non-state actors. Country believing in the powerful role of the private sector, having a key role to play as a driver for transformation. Countries believing that uh, uh, unless you begin to put your own resources, to prioritize putting your own resources into making transformation happen, you will be waiting for the own partners to come and do it for you. They will set the, 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 the agenda for you, they will set the direction, and it will not happen the way you wanted it to. There is clear evidence, very well documented, history has published on the matter. As we are talking, I'm trying to retrieve the information so I can share the link with a uh, way right is interested. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Augustine. I, I have several people asking questions around the 10% commitment that started in Maputo in 2003 and whether we have achieved anything with that as African countries, where heads of state sat down and said, we are going to put 10% of our annual national budget expenditure to agriculture and rural development. This was in Maputo in 2003 and it was in Malabo in 2014. How well are we doing on this one? And uh, Fatmata, I just want to get your sense from ECOWAS, uh, just as a snapshot of Africa. Uh, I, what's the challenge here? Is the, are, are we still having arguments about what's in 10% or are, are the countries that you're dealing with now fully compliant and spending 10% of their budgets on agriculture and everything is hunky-dory? Um, what's the status? Okay, thank you very much, Robert. Um, from the ECOWAS point, um, I think one of the challenges we have had is the change of government. So every five years or so, we have new addition. And um, if you don't hurry up to go and resensitize that government on the cadre process, it means you are starting all over again. But recently, as recent as um, April, in, in line with the uh, research, ISPRI research, we did a quick analysis to know where we really are as ECOWAS on the 10%. And um, from the analysis that was done, we have Mali and Burkina Faso that have actually exceeded the 10%. Senegal and Niger are close. They are around 9 to 9.5%. Sierra Leone is around 6.5%. And we have a few countries that are below 4%, Cote d'Ivoire, Gambia, and Nigeria, but there are also others that are below 2%. So if you take a regional picture, ECOWAS with Nigeria, we are only at 4%. ECOWAS without Nigeria, we are about 5.0%. So we are trying to the extent possible, we have been able to sensitize the country, so we do resensitization when governments change, but there are a few countries that have owned and agreed and are committed to the 10%, and there are a few that we are still battling with them to really understand why it's important because it was a commitment in 2003. So as ECOWAS, a lot of effort is being made, and I think um, just May, first week of May, we came from few countries where we had to again resell this entire process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fatimata. So I hear 4%, 5%, depending on whether you have Nigeria in or not. And I know that back here in East Africa, in Kenya, it's probably something to do with 2 to 3%, and that's not any different from some of our neighbors as well. Um, so I'm wondering, because this is at the core of, of CADAP's success, uh, how this sits with you, Ernest, uh, your audio was a little bit grainy earlier on. Um, would you therefore, and, and now I'm looking at the clock, I think we're going to stop in, in, in less than, in about eight minutes, so I'm going to probably ask my final questions um, just to leave time to close up. 
Um, would you say, Ernest, that given uh, the totality of the information we have, that CADAP is headed in the right direction? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Robert. I think uh, we need to also be very positive because we have uh, more than 44 countries who, which have signed the compact, 47 countries which reported on the progress of CADAP. We have 20 countries which are on the track uh, uh, to achieve to achieving Malabo uh, target by 2025, and you have countries making greater uh, efforts to invest in agriculture. Yes, not to 10 percent, but if you compare fiscal year to fiscal year, you will see that the budget to agriculture is actually increasing. And I, I think uh, there is something to celebrate here, but we need to be aware that. Uh, we also have a lot of efforts to make. Uh, we are talking about 10%, but we are not able to really break into mobilizing private sector investment in Africa, and this is really central. And I think uh, if you check all the seven commitments, there are key areas where it needs to be uh, efforts need to be to, to be put especially commitments on ending hunger. You see that we are still lagging behind on, on resilience. So there are much as we are achieving, but also I think we, we really need to, to put emphasis on key areas that, uh, make that will make agricultural transformation to happen. But uh, I believe that the infrastructure is, is on place. The mechanisms are already are unknown. It's a matter of actually, again, working together to uh, make sure that we implement this uh, Marabo Declaration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. So basically, there is a lot of progress, but there is also a lot of challenges and a lot of work ahead. Um, I'll pose the same question to you, Fatmata. Uh, in your opinion, is CADAP headed in the right direction? Yes. CADAP is headed in the right direction, but it could be improved at all three levels. That's the continental, regional, and country level. Between the first phase of the CADAP and the second phase, I think a lot of progress has been made because people have owned the process to a very large extent. So I think we are, we are there. And um, we have tried to establish a lot of systems and mechanisms because you could see that um, between 2014 and now, especially during the first biennial review process, we have also been able to establish or re-establish because they existed before, but they were not very formal. We have our technical networks. Before, we know that research exists at all the regional economic blocks, but during the first year process, um, we can see that we now have it really very formal at the continental level. We are using those same experts for DR processes, for the night processes, as well as for specific um, economic modeling or simulations, even at the regional level. So we are beginning to have our systems and structures in place. For me, I think as long as those ones exist, gradually we will get there. So yes, CADEP is heading in the right direction. Thank you very much, Fatmata, speaking from Abuja. Um, we are, our structures and processes are in place. We just need to um, intensify our efforts. Um, Augustine, do you agree with your two colleagues on this question? Yes, I agree with what colleagues have suggested. Uh, we have to be positive, as Ernest mentioned. Uh, a lot of things are happening. What we shouldn't do is to uh, drop the ball simply because we keep repeating. I think we have to repeat. The more we repeat, the more the message gets across. We are aware of countries that are only joining, embracing fully the process now. Yet we have been courting those countries, literally pushing them to embrace for 10 years. Uh, just last year they say, wow, we didn't know how good CADEP was. 
now with the VR, with what countries have gained from the from embracing the Maputo uh, process, we are in a stronger position today to say that we are convinced that this is the way to go. Uh, I believe that uh, it's a very good uh, framework, it's a very powerful framework to compel alignment vis-à-vis -vis external players that are coming to support actions on the ground, but also to force the government to make sure that what it's trying to do in agriculture is fully responding to what is contained in the natural development plan. So it's, it's, it's something that's very powerful. That gives a platform also to rally in, in a very coordinated manner all the key players, all the key constituencies. Uh, in quite a few countries, we didn't have that before. CADES has made it possible, and uh, it is in our interest now to apply the findings or the lessons that have been learned so far to make sure that uh, we continue to better the process. So to me, it is an important tool. It's just a matter of us making sure that uh, we continue to keep it alive. We continue to uh, bring on board the innovations that are emerging, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much, Augustine. Uh, on that very positive note, CADAP is alive and kicking. We just need to um, to intensify efforts. Uh, and I want to thank you, Augustine, Wambo Yamju, Fatmata Seiwo, and Anes Ruzindaza for your uh, responses and for the fascinating conversation we just had. I couldn't get to so many questions that we needed to cover. Uh, because time, as always, is limited, and we had some technical challenges at the beginning. But this has been a, a wonderful experience for me personally, and I want to thank all those who joined uh, the conversation while listening in with the lots and lots of feedback that we've received. Uh, this has been quite uh, useful, I believe, for everyone. Uh, the conversation continues beyond... Uh, this in other fora, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll continue to address these questions. I'd like to hand over to my colleague Shannon Sabo, whom you met earlier on, uh, for some uh, closing remarks as well. Thanks so much to everybody for your active participation, and especially to our panelists from all over Africa. Um, I think we can all agree we only really scratched the surface today. So one of our main objective of this conversation was to find out what are some of the specific technical topics and other issues that are of interest to our stakeholders. So I think we've got a lot of those already identified. I think what we'll try to do as part of Africa Lee's learning series over the next few months is address and dive deeper to some of these things. Um, we were just discussing internally as a team right here, maybe what we're talking about is a blog post specifically answering some of the questions that have come through. One of the other colleagues here on the chat bot said, actually, maybe we could do a three-part series. So we might look at other webinars. Um, I think the main thing is that we wanted to kind of get everybody on the same page as a basis for discussion, and it looks like we've done that. So what you've got on your screen right now are a couple of resources that were launched last week, the CAT at PP. I encourage everybody to go to these links. The first one is what we're calling the Biannual Review Toolkit. But really what it is is the data that was produced as part of this process and available in an online, interactive, user-friendly format. So you can actually go online, filter by country, filter by other things you're interested in, download PowerPoints. It's a much more user-friendly, um, accessible way to kind of interact with this data for your own purposes. The second one is what's called a knowledge compendium, and it's uh, about Malabo domestication itself, so that process that Augustine was describing and we were talking about earlier on. So please check out these resources. Um, the, next, the next slide should be about some of the upcoming learning series events that we had anticipated. But like I said, these were kind of illustrative upcoming ideas. I think we've already identified a couple other ones. Um, there was some interest uh, from the audience on the CADEP peer-to-peer network. We might be doing something to engage other stakeholders in that, um, ask, ask the expert sessions or things that we've held in, in the past. Uh, we might do something on just the biannual review data itself, maybe a walkthrough of the toolkit, help people interact, download, ask specific questions, query certain things. 
These three we've got up here right now are a little bit self-explanatory, but just quickly, facilitative leadership coming up in August. This is an approach that we've found is really critical to facilitating these multi-stakeholder dialogue processes and interacting across organizations, across institutions. Institutional architecture, assessment, prioritization, and planning. This is a toolkit of facilitation support tools based on the institutional architecture framework that's really about strengthening and improving platforms for policy dialogue and evidence-based decision-making. And this last one has to do with actually the topic of resilience. Um, we've been working with some of our partners in the arid and semi-arid regions of Kenya um, to collaborate together uh, using collective impact and the collective impact framework for increasing collaboration across donor projects and, and local government priorities. So anyway, that's just a bit of uh, stay tuned for more information on AgriLinks. Again, thanks everybody so much for your participation. This, this will only be the beginning. Great, and on behalf of USAID and Feed the Future, I'd like to thank our speakers, our panelists, and most importantly, our attendees for engaging uh, so wonderfully in the chat box and for being part of the AgriLinks webinar series. Thank you all, and be on the lookout for the post-event resources. Have a good afternoon or evening, everyone. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.